Hey friends of wine lovers, how are you? Welcome. I'm Mark Subsick. I'm a certified wine professional and I'm here on behalf of Wine Still Sold Out. I get asked to do a lot of wine tastings and one of the most common themes is European wines versus American wines. Inevitably the takeaway is usually that American wines just seem so much bigger. So with this particular weekly tasting pack I figured we could explore this. Let's figure out and understand how it is that American wines predominantly came to be this way. Now, if you'd rather skip over all the information and just get straight to the tasting, I completely understand. There's a link underneath this video that you can click on that will take you to that part. Otherwise, if you give me about two minutes, I want to give you some brief background on how American wines got to where they are. There are records of wine being made all over the North American continent since about the 1500s. States like Florida, New Mexico, Kentucky, and even Ohio can lay claim to some of the first wineries in the country. Inevitably, it was California that was slated to become the top producer of wine in the United States. Latin missionaries made their way through Central America and up the West Coast, bringing grapes, namely the mission grape, along with them. And it was there in California that they found the perfect growing environment. By the 1850s, California was already well established as far as winemaking is concerned, thanks in part to the boom from the gold rush. Now, as the European immigrants flocked to California in hopes of striking it rich, they brought some of their winemaking traditions and their grapes with them, too. The red wines they were making were modeled after those of Italy and France, but being made in a decidedly New World style. First of all, because California was warmer, the alcohol content was higher in these wines. Another factor that leads these wines to become big and complex is the European tradition of blending grapes together. Blending grapes is no different than cooking with multiple ingredients. The idea is to add more layers of complexity and flavor. A third factor that contributed to this American style was the use of American oak instead of French oak. Lastly, it's right around in the 70s that you see California winemakers getting curious about the North. They're starting to look to Oregon and Washington. So in my opinion, it's all of these factors, uh, largely starting over on the west coast of the United States, that are laying the groundwork for this American style. And with that in mind now, let's taste these things. In this weekly tasting, we have one wine here from Oregon and two from California. And don't forget to download this tasting mat here that I made specifically for this weekly tasting pack. All of the wines in this weekly tasting pack are blends. Mm. This red blend called Glacial is from winemaker Andrew Rich, and it's made predominantly with the French Syrah grape. It's blended with two other French grapes called Morvedre and Grenache. Let's look at the color very quickly. And in the center, it's like this medium intense ruby color, but if you look at that edge, it's starting to turn orange, which is what happens when a wine starts to get older. Let's give it a sniff. There's a gaminess to this wine, almost an animal quality. All right, let's give it a swirl. There's some cherry cola and cranberry developing on the nose. At 14.2% alcohol, this is a fairly big wine, but believe it or not, this is not as big as Syrah typically goes. This is actually a lighter example. <laughs> and it's got this candied cherry quality to it as well that I think is coming from the Grenache grape. There's a slight woodiness to this, but it's not super heavily oaked. And as mentioned before, it is a five-year-old wine, so it's starting to get a little bit older. And as most Syrah gets older, it exhibits these gamey qualities, these musky qualities to it. This next wine is from Forward Kid, and it's a blend of grapes sourced from all over the Napa Valley region. And clocking in at 14.5% alcohol, I don't think this wine is going to go forward, sideways, or anywhere very quietly. You can see that it's a pretty dense wine, almost opaque, and that comes mostly from Petite Syrah. My first impression is that uh, if you could actually smell the color purple, <laughs> this is what purple would smell like. Let's give it a swirl. There's sort of a uh, brown sugar element to this. Okay, let's give it a taste. It's very full-bodied and there's some heat in there thanks to the 14.5% alcohol. There is some black fruit in there, but this is overall a more savory and herbaceous wine. So therefore, this seems to be sort of like a muscular American approach to a more traditional European wine. Let's talk about this last blend here. This is from Brandlin Vineyards in Mount Veter, Napa. And it's actually named uh, Prince and Pedro after the two horses, you see. This red blend uses six different grapes. Six. And at 14.8% alcohol, we definitely saved the biggest for the last. Okay, if we take a quick look at the color here, we can see how 
dark and dense that is. And that makes sense with six different grapes. There's a hint of exotic spice in there, almost like coriander. Swirl it up. If you grew up on the East Coast, especially in Pennsylvania where I'm from, uh, it reminds me of Frank's Black Cherry Wish Nyack Soda. It's a pretty powerful wine at 14.8% alcohol, but it's also soft and velvety too. That's probably the Merlot in the blend. And there's a nice vanilla and exotic spice finish on this wine too, which comes from barrel aging. Let's talk about some food pairings now because you're gonna get a couple recipes along with this pack. The first recipe is for a spiced duck breast with a citrus honey glaze. A duck in general is usually a beautiful pairing with red wines. We don't often think about it, but citrus is actually a flavor enhancer. And believe it or not, citrus peel, especially orange peel, works beautifully with red wine. The second recipe is for a roasted beet and fennel salad. Now, beets are one of my secret weapons whenever I do wine and food pairings. They work so well with red wine, they bring out this beautiful juicy characteristic. And lastly, we have a recipe for pasta a la norma, which is pasta with eggplant. And I thought this was very uh, seasonally apropos right now. We're in mid-August, people are gardening, the farmer's markets are up, and so what's better than fresh produce on the table? Today, every state in the Union makes wine, and they're not all being made in this big and bold style. So it may be more accurate to say that there was once a West Coast style that was largely informing the way most American wines were being made. As more and more states come into their own and local winemakers adapt to their region and also apply their own personal tastes to the winemaking process, you're not going to see one singular American style anymore. And that's probably a good thing. Diversity is beautiful. But this big, bold approach, largely influenced by the West Coast, is the American original and it's probably not going to go away anytime soon. And there's one more thing, and this is more a personal observation than it is actual fact, but America and American culture, not necessarily known for its subtlety. We're a nation of people that are used to living large in everything that we do. So it makes sense that we gravitate towards wines that are the same. Thank you so much for joining me for this weekly tasting pack, and I hope you really enjoyed these wines, and of course learned something along the way too. The conversation does not have to stop here, of course. If you have any comments or thoughts about these or any wines in general, you can always reach me by dropping a comment in the comment section below this video, and I will get back to you. On behalf of Wines Still Sold Out, I'm Mark Subsick. Cheers.